Welcome to Be Your Own Best Coach with JJ. Today, I have the honor and privilege to interview Ruth Hibbert. Ruth Hibbert is a highly accomplished teacher, author, mindset coach, hypnotherapist, and master practitioner who has taught, coached, and led curriculum development in Australian primary, secondary, and English language center schools since 2006. A positive change maker in education, Ruth is an expert in building skills, confidence, and positive relationships with students, parents, and teachers, having taught over 3,000 students from a diverse range of social and learning needs. Ruth also uses unique, safe, five-dimensional therapies to facilitate self-healing for her clients aged 7 to 24. That's brilliant. Treating the root cause of negative emotions such as anxiety, depression, PTSD and limiting beliefs. In December 2019, Ruth successfully self-published a personal development book titled Do Make Mistakes, The Secret to Success Every Teen Should Know. Recently, Ruth's success with teenagers and her book, Do Make Mistakes, has gained media attention, being interviewed and with articles published by six newspapers internationally and in Australia. Ruth is currently completing her second book for teachers, which will be released in March 2022, so not too, too long to go. Uh, welcome, Ruth. Hi. Hi, JJ. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, I'm thrilled that you are here. And uh, look, you know, how, how long have you been teaching for? So is it 2006? Is that right? Yes, yeah. And I, I, I'm one of those teachers that always went into bat for students. So um, I ended up leaving teaching after 10 years and had it saying, you know, I've had enough of this. Um, I'm out. Um, yeah. I was obsessed with studying success and I didn't like what I saw. So I, I headed out and yeah. then went into real estate and then went back in. I didn't even know that about you. Yeah. How many years have we known each other for? Um, maybe eight. Yeah, about, yeah, about that. I didn't even know that about you. That's interesting. Oh, and when I say real estate, I was flipping houses with my sister. Oh, Wow. You know, I've, I, I love houses and I, I often say there's a couple of things. If I wasn't a coach, I'd either be a cook uh, or I would be a, a TV interviewer. <laughs> I'd love to do that. Or I'd do something with houses. So, uh, yeah, that's exciting. So you've been teaching for a long time. And, like how have you, with everything that's happening in the world, how, how have you navigated What's happening with, and for, for those that are listening, we're going through COVID in Australia uh, at the moment. How have you navigated through all of that as a teacher? Oh, it's been really challenging. Um, and having been in, in school, in the school system for, and out of the school system, both having running my business alongside being in the school system during one of the most just the longest lockdowns that we had in Victoria. I think yeah. it was like 275 days in the Melbourne region. Yeah, um, and the whole time it was just I had to lead myself and be my best, my best self and my own best coach to stand up and just be a role model and a positive light for anyone who I saw online, offline, but particularly online. And just bringing joy and love to through the camera was my my mission. Whether I was seeing a client for anxiety, or I was teaching a numeracy improvement class session, one on one or in a small group, I just thought, how can I bring humor or joy or light, you know, through the the camera to young people when yeah. there's a world full of uncertainty. Yeah, and you know, certain as humans we crave certainty, and I can imagine with you know the younger generation how they're dealing with it particularly when relationships are so important you know the, at the younger ages when they can't catch up with their friends uh, and there's this whole change of uh, being at home rather at school 
you know, it's been great to have someone like you that's been able to support them online um, through that time. What sort of challenges do you see that the kids have been facing? Um, well, unfortunately, in in our region, I know when in the in the local community, teen suicide was horrific. I yeah. think we lost eight or nine teenagers during lockdowns, and it was it was just losing hope. Yeah, you know, teenagers losing hope of uh, and looking, waiting to go back to normal, and then it not happening, and then losing hope. And the biggest thing I felt was a challenge was having to support parents who were being told to put their kids as young as nine or ten onto antidepressants medication. Yeah. And so for me, it was critical to teach parents and 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 young people that there are so much, there's so there's so many easy and fun ways to to get rid of negative emotions and limiting beliefs. You don't need to medicate your children who and, and shut their emotions off yeah. when they're still developing. So that was really hard, hard, really big challenge was educating people about how the unconscious mind works and the conscious mind works and how you can set up certainty at home through routines and organization and bring more certainty into the into their world so that yeah. they're not looking for uncertainty in other things. And when you're when you're dealing with the kids, I'd imagine you have a lot to do with the adults as well, the parents and how they deal with that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I ended up seeing more more parents than I did children during the lockdowns right. and, and teachers as well. And I know myself as a parent of teenager and a preteen and during a lockdown, the biggest effect I found was on relationships between husband and wife or yeah. in families was that pressure that it put on the relationship. Um, so, you know, uh, one of the parents could have been out working and very unhappy was yeah. the relationship, but it was like a pressure cooker, wasn't it? And then yeah. the kids were at home and having to navigate, getting their, getting, helping them with their education and having everyone on, online. Um, there were days that I, I just told a lot of parents, actually, this, my advice was just, um, just get them offline. <laughs> just, just get the kids offline. Just, yeah. just go for a walk with your husband or your wife just, and, and ground yourself. In nature that was a, a key thing really was grounding in nature yeah and then because there's also I think a lot of conflict uh, in regards to different belief systems about what's happening in the world as well and I can imagine if there's a mom and a dad that think differently or the grandma thinks differently and then you've got the kid involved that would you know real, really be a really challenging time for the kids yeah and and a lot of parents had so much have have not had because they still do have there's so much stress and pressure on their shoulders and in our in our, in our world now of parenting we all are expected to be perfect all the time yeah yeah and I know my kids they witness me you know have a good cry <laughs> <laughs> and I think I, we all have in the last couple of years. I don't, don't think we'd be human if we didn't. <laughs> and I, I wanted them to see that and go, you know, like mum's feeling really sad right now and mum's really upset because, you know, I don't know what to do here. Um, yeah. And then they, yeah, it was, it was important to, to teach kids how to be aware of their emotions and their environment. Yeah. And, and yeah. Um, it was, it was, it was, and also um, I really, I, I, with all the work that I've done in the last, I, I don't know, I can't remember now, like 17 years. Yeah. One of my biggest wins was myself and as a parent and a teacher and, and as a friend and a sister and a daughter and everything, all my responsibilities I have in life. Yeah. Is to be, have a high, high level of emotional intelligence to be able to teach that. Yeah. And um, my second secret, I have five secrets to success that you don't learn yeah. at school. And the second one is awareness. And yeah, I think it was really big during what's been happening and still is happening 
to have to have the awareness but to teach it to your children to think for themselves because yeah. you could have awareness from a very skewed perspective yeah. um and then no, but then also you don't you, you've also got to teach them you know it's, it's great to find your own information but yeah. you've also got to have awareness of where that information's coming from and how it makes you feel yeah and if it's making you feel bad making you feel upset depressed angry and then just have that awareness to not look at that information yeah because there were there were a lot of kids that they they had they were off you know researching what was going on they were finding stuff out but it actually was crippling them because they were they were actually getting depressed from that and then other and then other a lot of other young people and parents and families off and were um uh were ignorant to the fact that it was even happening so it was sort of like this two, two polar extremes and sort yeah. of finding that middle ground like it's how they regulate that, isn't it? And how the parents can help regulate that for the kids. Yeah, yeah. And I think the main thing was, as a parent with children, the last two years, what I really noticed, what, one thing that worked really well with my family was yeah. just the whole language around when no one is excluding anyone. We are inclusive. We're always inclusive. So... Yeah. If someone has a different belief system to you or is saying stuff that is really triggering you, yeah, what you think and believe could be triggering them. Yeah. And we just have to have this very compassionate, um, empathetic attitude to be inclusive. And I remember, I remember I was at the supermarket one day and there was this man who, old older man who was trying to figure out how to do shopping and it was when all the shelves were half empty right yeah and I remember just walking past them and I just my intuition just told me to stop and because he was having trouble and his wife was had been put into a um because that's what I spoke to this man his wife had been put into a um retirement home or aged care and she was very yeah. ill and he was trying to make this recipe and he couldn't find the bicarb soda yeah. It's, really, it's really hard to find bicarb soda. <laughs> <laughs> and his mask was falling down and he was trying. And I said to him, you know, do you need some help? And, you know, help them find the bicarb soda. And then he said he was really upset with his mask. And then I said to him, you know, why don't you just just take it down? Like, because I was, I had mine. I'll take mine off too. And then, like, he just smiled. We just smiled. And then I, I didn't, I never met that man again. But just that, um, uh, he did, he was just really needed someone to smile at him and say hi and so he could feel included. Yeah. And, and it, you know, yeah. I think it's seeking to understand, isn't it? You know, Stephen Covey says, you know, seek first to understand and then you can be understood. So being able to, you know, look back, look outside of yourself and understand those around us, how they might be feeling, if they're thinking differently from us. Um, and I think that's a respectful way to operate as a human being yeah absolutely yeah so so tell me so you're not in uh the education system anymore is that right no um I made the choice um pro choice to step down last year in October I made that choice to 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 leave um yep. I was I was in, in education to make a difference and be a positive change and especially in the area of, that I was working in, which was in maths anxiety. Yeah. And there weren't many people around who were actually um, helping it train teachers and, and help students with anxiety. Yeah. Because um, a lot of the traditional methods um, without going, going there, because <laughs> I can't legally, but a lot of stuff, just, it just doesn't work. You know, talk therapy does not work in yep. a lot of cases. In some cases it does. But when you're dealing with trauma, you know, um, especially layers of trauma, talking about it and bringing it up again is not actually focusing on a solution. So everything I do is like, all right, here's, here's a problem. Yeah. Yep. Do we want it or do we not want it? Okay, we don't want it. Let's throw that away, get the learning. And here's let's focus just on the solution. And we're just moving towards the solution. 
And so, um, yeah, so I, I'm only, I'm now, I, I, the reason I was, um, JJ, the reason I was, I was hanging on to the bumper yeah. <laughs> of being in the institution of education, it was because I've always, uh, for the last five years, I've worked with refugee students and kids who have a lot of trauma and yeah. have been failing and failing and failing maths sometimes for 10 years. And it brings me so much joy to be with them and to be yeah. a person in their life that can help them and see see where the gaps are and see um, give them some tools and strategies to use. And, and often um, it could be the only time that someone's offered a solution and, and they could feel quite in, in victim mode and quite defeated. So I was, I was hanging on for them. And even though I was extremely busy and I just needed to step out and do, do just be hundred percent in my business, I, I was, I was, uh, was, was great sadness. Um, I had to say goodbye. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so interesting, isn't it? With, I don't know, when I, when I started coaching, was the time where I really started questioning the school system. And look, I think this, there's some great stuff in school as well. But then there was so much stuff that as an adult, I thought, firstly, why did I learn that? <laughs> and secondly, like I've never worked with hypotheses or whatever Pythagoras theory in my life again after school. Uh, but also that, you know, even history, um, all of, you know, it's so important because when you're young, as you would know, you know, from the age of five to seven, that's when we start forming our belief systems around the world. Uh, and so we're learning that from our teachers. And often, yes, we learn it from our parents, but we're, we're at school for a long, you know, a long time, more time than when we're with the parents. And so, you know, even things with history that we've learned that I'm now questioning as an adult, is that true? Mm -hmm. uh, but also from a, I suppose, a practical sense, because for me as a coach, mindset is everything. And I know that you share that passion, because if we haven't got this right, then it's going to affect everything in our life. And so I don't feel that, that at school, when I went to school, that we were given the tools and skills to be able to empower our minds effectively so that therefore things like people going through depression or anxiety all of that stuff I think can be eliminated most of that can be eliminated if you have really good teaching around it um, so what are your what are your thoughts around that yeah, oh, that's really exciting. I love this topic. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I've been really great at is merging the skill that yeah. has been taught with the mindset, and the personal development, yeah. And, yeah. and bringing that together. And I just spent three days, JJ, <laughs> on video training up teachers to work in my mindset tutoring program, Mindset Maths and Mindset English, yeah, uh, which is a big, big, um, just it's just the most incredible way to help kids who are behind in maths and yeah. English because it's bringing in the mindset and the mindset shift and being embedded into every single thing that you do. And I watched these teachers who were great teachers, and I I, I screened um, to get the absolute best teachers. And the sad thing is that these teachers and education support staff workers had lost their job they were feeling defeated having to go into like a cleaning job or um you know drive a truck so I'm, I'm and the reason I'm saying that it's not because I devalue those jobs it's because these are teachers that might have taught for 40 years who've got kids lining up to beg to be in their classes who have and they're passionate people. about it too huh yeah they live and breathe it because a really great teacher goes to work for their passion not for a paycheck and yeah. so of, you know, the 15,000 teachers that I know of in Victoria and up, up to 30,000 in Queensland and 20,000 in New South Wales, of teachers who have had to leave the profession have decided pro-choice to step back 
they are not the teachers that are going for a paycheck. Otherwise, they'd still be there. Yeah. A lot of them. And I'm not making a big judgment and stereotype here, but most of the teachers that I come across who are in that position are feeling a piece of them has been taken out, like someone's cut out their heart because they couldn't say goodbye to their students. They couldn't yeah. talk to the parents. They weren't allowed to treat like a criminal, was not allowed even a step in the car park to get them to collect their things. Yeah. And after a life of service, um, so yeah, th- th- I'm getting on attention here, JJ, but what I, was, what I meant to say was these great teachers, I said to them, you know, this is the science behind what you do. And now I'm gonna teach you how to bring in your expertise, your passion in maths or your expertise and passion in English. And here's the mindset and how the brain works. And here's what we're going to do to transform these, these students' thinking. Yes. And they were just so excited and amazed. And some of them were telling me how much, you know, one of the teachers were telling me, oh, I do that all the time. I didn't realise what I was doing. Oh, I can just add that little bit in. And now I'm changing that child's awareness and they can get out of their trauma. Yeah. And so I was really excited to learn to meet these great teachers and, and to have them on board with me to, um, to really help kids with mindset, not just the maths or the English. Yeah. Board. To have a great teacher, like I remember one of my teachers, Miss Bailey, if she's watching and listening, <laughs> I don't know where she is, uh, but she made such an impact on me as a young girl teachers can have and and they then they can have the the opposite effect you know a teacher can say one statement and I've coached people that have remembered that statement at 60 years of age and so you know to to have great role models teachers are role models they're teachers I'm a teacher I'm a coach I'm a teacher Uh, but I find that the system is quite indoctrined Mm. and what I mean by that it's 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 you know the the whole um materials that that um most schools are told to talk are not adaptable for kids and I remember listening to a it was uh an experiment that happened now you probably would have heard of this experiment Ruth where there were two groups of kids And one group of kids were seen as the high achievers. And then the other group of kids were seen as the slow learners. And what they did was they actually got some teachers and they gave the high achievers to a set of teachers and they told them that they were the slow learners. And then they got the slow learners to another group of teachers and they told the teachers that these were the high achievers. And it was interesting what happened because the teachers that had the high achievers but thought they were slow learners, these guys, their learning capacity went down because they treated, you know, they they treated them as such. Now, these guys that were slow learners, they the teachers were teaching them and they weren't grasping it straight away. So then the teachers thought, oh, hold on a minute, these are high achievers. It must be us and our mm-hmm. teaching that's not working so we have to adjust it so they adjusted their teaching and then they started to thrive and it was you know them labeling you know the the high achievers and the slow learners just by labeling groups of people or individuals in a certain way and not being able to adapt I think it's beautiful for what you're doing because you're really adapting to the individual you know you're really adapting to that child who uh you know has different interests and as I said that mindset is really important that you and and has different traumas different belief systems you know different stuff at home all of those things are so important aren't they absolutely and I know um having two children how completely polar opposite they are in their and it's and I've parented them the same way but their beliefs are slightly different they um, they would both be labelled completely different in the school system, which, which they have, you know. I have one high achiever who I'd call him a high achiever and I hate labels of throwing them all out. But, you know, he's always been, you know, a year or two years ahead in this curriculum 
He's always been very confident and he's always just everything you touch kind of turns to gold. And he received like a $5,000 scholarship thanks to um, doing his um, a lot of work in his um, public speaking. And he had, had, a, had a session with you, I remember. I know. <laughs> yes. I'm so proud of him where he's come. And then, so, um, and then, you know, he became, you know, year seven captain, year eight captain, and just immediately just, just this blue stage away and 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 then another child who has always had his school has been begging me to homeschool for three years actually invested in crypto on his birthday money and Christmas money because yeah. he, he asked me how much it would cost to pay a teacher or to pay me to stay home so he could do homeschool because he hates <laughs> school that much <laughs> because yeah. he has an auditory processing disorder and when he was five, he he got he got um, had a health problem, he got anaphylactic to nuts. And I, knowing what I know and what I do, I just I did, refused to accept that his life was going to be, you know, just being allergic to everything because it was yeah. one, then it was the next, then it was the next. So he did some treatment and he got rid of it. So now he can eat nuts. Wow, that's and, um, But he missed some phonics in grade five because he was at appointments, and then he got a little bit behind. And then he's such a social. You know butterfly that yeah. what people thought of him was important so he then decided he had a belief system that he's stupid and he couldn't read and so it took me three years even knowing what I know for him to love reading and to be to be able to read yeah. and the effects of that I'm still working with that daily the effects yeah. of what happened just it just takes one teacher in one for one year which is a common story that I get from parents you know yeah. When my son was in grade four, he was top of the class in maths, loved maths. But then in grade five, just went and through a horrible year. And and then it's, and then he's they've lost their confidence. And so it's just this, it's so basically the short wind of all this explanation, JJ, is having two polar opposite children. The best thing for both of my children at the moment, even if I wasn't, even if not thing existed even if the c word and the v word did not exist the best thing in the world for my children is homeschooling right now yeah and and it was an epiphany for me because i um had a lot of fear and judgment about the potential of homeschooling even though it's been in my head for so long um yeah. and i had a moment when my son came into my office my oldest child who um was did really well in school you, you know cliche perfect student came yeah. in and just bowled his eyes out and said, mum, I have nothing in common with anyone in my school. Yeah. I can't take another lesson doing analysing texts about COVID. I can't have another conversation with anyone in my year level about, my, they don't understand mindset. They don't understand. They all want to talk about the fear and everything of what's happening in the world. And I feel like I'm always alone and just devastated horrible yeah and could see him really thinking that he was unusual and weird and different and then already me me as a parent going oh I didn't even realize it would be affecting him as much as the little one because the little one's the one who who rocks the boat all the time and is the one coming home you know because he's trying to process his day where he's gotten into trouble for speaking out about something and yeah. Yeah, so just JGL was awful. And I thought, right, I have to create my own school system for these, for my son. And that was the day where I created inclusive learning. And it was for my children initially. I thought, well, how can I make a group of like minded parents and kids? Because I want, I'm, I was completely selfish. I want my, ki my kids to have friends that think like them. Yeah. I, I don't want them to feel like they're the only person that has emotional or um, emotional intelligence or awareness about themselves, who they are and what's going on in the world. Yeah. And they're feeling different. So yeah, I was completely selfish. I created it for, <laughs> for me, and for my children. And then just went, everyone, a couple of people said to me, well, I want that too. And I want that too. Can you just make it bigger and give me your stuff? <laughs> Oh, well, I'm glad that you did. And you, the interesting thing is that, and we talked about indoctrined and belief systems and all of that. And if I think back as a parent 
the decisions. And of course, we always want to make the right decisions for our kids. But I've changed my mindset in regards to, I think sometimes we, we put, we, we have this belief system, it's like a box, and this is how things should be. You know, you, you have children, they go to school, they come home from school, they finish year 12, they go to college, they get a good job, they get, we have this whole system of how it should be based on how we've been indoctrined, mm. <laughs> how we've been taught, how the belief systems are. But what about if that's not true? And I think if I had my time again as a parent, I would absolutely homeschool again, uh, at homeschool. I would absolutely, without a doubt, because I think I want to know what my my child, my kids, are, uh, you know, their belief systems. I want them to, I want to be part of that. And I think, and, and I think there's, there'd be a lot of challenges around homeschooling, but I think values and beliefs that you want to instill in your children it's important that we're we're a part of that. So I would absolutely have homeschooled. Um, what do you think the challenges are with homeschooling? Oh, they are great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're great. Um, look, uh, the biggest I think the biggest thing is time. Yeah, time and and fear of. I think the biggest fear people have is. The making the decision it's very hard to make that decision as an educator I don't know and I don't I, I know how I felt so someone who's who's not an educator having to make that decision is even a big bigger decision and I really think the fear that we have it's not even our fear but it comes from generations back but yeah. I remember um I was sitting there and I was I was talking to my sister about it and I knew my only option was homeschool I knew I had to get to that point. And even though I knew it, I kept saying all these excuses and I was hearing myself talk and go, why am I making a decision based on the judgment of someone I don't know or that I do know or family members? Yeah. And even family members who were deceased, I was scared of their judgment because when I was a kid growing up, yeah. there was some someone in my family because it was a very it was a very minority of people homeschooled their kids yeah and they're always extreme it was always someone who got they picked on at family barbecues you know people would talk and make fun of them because they were weird and homeschooling their kids and I thought oh my god what are people going to say about me and then I thought and if I'm if I'm if I'm putting myself out there in my business as an expert and I make the wrong decision and my kids it was all these fears of what was going to happen to them they wouldn't have the same opportunities and yeah. they wouldn't have friends and you know I'm gonna have a teenager sitting on gaming the whole or whole week being online if he's doing online schooling so much fear and judgment JJ yeah. and um and then I thought about it and I realized how amazing it could be like yeah how completely transformational and amazing it could be with the right routines, the right organization, the right intention, because intention is everything. Yeah. And also knowing myself that I was going to outsource a lot of the teaching. Most of the teaching is going to go to yeah. someone else. So our relationship is separate. Yeah. And, you know, I can teach maths, but I don't really want to teach my kids maths. I'm happy to teach everyone else's kids maths. Yeah. But <laughs> just having, having that awareness, well, there. You know, um, if we, if we, because money is a big thing, money was huge as well. Thinking, if I'm giving up my day job, and let's say I get $300 from my day job, but I'm paying $20 or $30 for my kid to have a teacher, and they're working with that teacher, even in a group of five. Yeah. And that teacher cares about them, has the same beliefs and values as me, and that teacher has a relationship with me. Yeah. And my, my child has so much rapport with them yeah. and they're not being stopped for behavior issues where I'm not having to travel. I'm not having to pay for uniforms and books and, and the time, you know, um, could be two hours a day in travel. Yeah. Um, and the money that I, the money I'm paying for that is so worth it. Like it's, it's worth it 10 times, 20 times to yeah. have, that pressure off my shoulders as a parent. Yeah. 
So it's really having a, a good system, you know, because we're used to the system of taking, getting the kids up in the morning, rushing out the door um, and, you know, taking them to school, then picking up at 3.30 or whatever it is. Uh, it's just a different system. It's just getting used to that system that works for you. Because I can imagine there's a lot of pros to homeschooling other than learning, being able to adapt the learning for the individual child, to do some fun stuff, getting out there in nature, you know, all of the stuff that I think that, and the mindset stuff, uh, you know, I think all of that. And you don't have to rush and get up in the morning and get them changed, you know. <laughs> Uh, and and you you can spend time with them as well. You know you've got that time with with your child. So how do you think? What systems that you think are important for someone that's thinking about homeschooling? Yeah, great question. Um, and this is a question I thought about for a while. Uh, yeah, I, it has to. You have to bring certainty into the home. Like that's my biggest, broadest, and most my best advice is. Um, school has, you know, a, a degree of certainty with it for children. And in a world of uncertainty, we have to balance that human need. And yeah. so the bells go at, you know, exactly the same time, don't they? And um, whether you agree or disagree with how that works, children have been almost hypnotised into that, that organisational system. They yeah. know when to go. They know when to go to their locker. They know, and they, they know the session times or a timetable. So my first point of call is making a timetable, a learning timetable. Yeah. And also I want my children to take responsibility for their learning. Yeah. And because when you're in, in, in the system of education, in, in, you know, in the traditional school system, that power gets taken away from you. So yeah. we can't just go, well, we're taking our kid out of school. Look, if I'm taking my kid out of school, I can't just expect them to be self-learners straight away because they've got to learn how to do that. Yeah. So with my children... The majority of their lessons and their their schoolwork is going to be done between Monday and Thursday. I've got one child who likes to get up early and one child who likes to sleep in. Yeah. So the class, the actual class of English and maths, in the because I'm making the timetable. Yeah, um, I've got this. So my my program that I've created, inclusive learning, has numeracy and literacy, so maths and English covered with Australian curriculum. Yeah. And it's about three hours a week where they have a small, tiny little class with a teacher, I'm the maths teacher, and Jacinta, who's amazing, is the English teacher. Yeah. And they have their live class and it's recorded. Yeah. And then it goes in a library in case someone's traveling or wants yeah. to come back and watch it again. And then they have time to ask questions. So there's sort of like three levels of that of that one subject because there's the live class and the skill is delivered, the yeah. teaching. Then there's the integration and practicing the skill, which they could do themselves if they don't want to talk to the teacher. Yeah. But there's nothing worse than sticking kids on computers for three hours, you know, for one subject. That's not needed. It's not, yeah. you don't need to sit and stare at a computer. And then the, the other session is, you know, and the teacher is available those whole, all those, for all those times to do the question and answers and, you know, to help kids and then to do a reflection and bring it all together. Yeah. So, so in terms of the organisation structure in my house, I'm putting the power to my children because they're a bit older to choose and make their own timetable around when the teacher's going to be on, when they're going to get up. There's certain, you know, certain goals because because two subjects that are bringing into this system, JJ, is there's a personal development and mindset subject and there's Yay. a community. Yay, <laughs> I finally get it as a subject. And so I'm running that. And so I will be teaching them my five sickness is success. So how to self-belief, how to believe in yourself and how to set goals. Um, awareness, which we talked about already. Emotional yeah. awareness, awareness, awareness of self, awareness of your environment. And the awareness of environment will be really critical for them taking ownership of their room and their homeschool area and where they're going to work. Yeah. And, and I never, ever, um, when I work with kids, I never... And parents too, adults too. I never tell them what to think. So I always guide them and they tell me what they're going to do. So I don't tell them what to do, but they'll come to me. They'll say, oh, yeah, I really shouldn't be, be near my computer when I'm doing my writing. Or I'm going to be tempted to, te to check Discord <laughs> or play games or get messages. So then yeah. 
And then, so then there's also the community subject, which is where they can have a passion project. And the other secrets, of course, is making mistakes, yeah. mindset and finding your why. Yeah. And that will be embedded. And so it'll be linked to exactly, because um, it'll be linked to the curriculum that we're doing at the time as well. So mindset will be embedded into English and maths as well, which is what I do. And that's the beauty of it. And then yeah. the community subject is going to be their passion project where they can have their social interaction with each other and the outside community because the socialization is what most a lot of people will worry about in homeschool because they're not in that yeah environment. absolutely but at the different point of difference here would be that their socialization is with like-minded people and so they're not but socialization people say oh but you know you're going to homeschool your kids well how are they develop their social needs yeah well if they're hanging out with the average five uh putting them down and they're feeling bad and they get into trouble then how is that good for them if they're yeah. socializing like that. yeah 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 um and so i so basically with me i move states i move states yeah. and we've set up a room in our home just for the homeschooling which is where i'm sitting actually because it faces the garden and it's got not good lighting and yeah. we literally have got um garage shelving like bunning shelves i bought a um dining setting off facebook for like 200 dollars. yeah and bought a cheap printer and decided you know what it doesn't have to be complicated low budget we just moved states um we wanted to just set up the structure of it so when we come in this room this is a vibe of learning it's a happy place to be there's no technology in here i'll put my laptop in here but there's no gaming in here yeah but oh, especially if you're worried about um teenage boys <laughs> being on yeah. games so not just teenagers but so this area is for homeschooling and yeah. so that's separate to their bedroom that's separate so and then all of the posters are going up on the wall now like all the timetables and yeah, so the yeah. organization and routines, JJ, in summary, is really important to. And it's similar to what I'm seeing is it's similar to, because I know that a lot of parents have had to adjust to working from home. And so they've had to think about, or oh, instead of driving to the office and uh, having the structure of being there at nine o'clock or whatever, they've had to then think about, well, how am I going to structure my, my working day? Where am I going to, you know, do my business? And so even where you interact, as you said, having a room for when you're doing your work uh, from, from a homeschool room, taking out any technology that you don't want there, it's really to setting up your environment, isn't it? Yeah. To make yeah. sure that, it's, that it really yeah. helps you succeed. And, you know, the, the whole thing about this, this program and everything that I've been doing recently is we look back on our mistakes, don't we? And we think, where did I go wrong? Like when that happened, where did I go wrong? <laughs> and like, as you know, I wrote a book about making mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I think I think to myself, it was all in my intention. Like if I have a belief that homeschooling my kids is going to be difficult, I'm not going to get any of my work done, and we're just going to up fighting all the time, we have to force them to do their work, and it's going to be a disaster. I'm going to get judged and laughed at by the community and my family. Yeah. Then I'm actually in that state of being, aren't I, an attraction. Like I'm actually just going, here I am. I'm Come and get me, disaster. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, I've set an intention that it's going to be easy. Um, I'm going to have time to run my business. And my business is teaching. So I'll be teaching. My kids will be learning at the same time. Yeah. um it's it's going to be it's going to be fun to go you know who wants to cook lunch today yeah you know yeah and that can be part of the process yeah. because and then yeah. it's the practical stuff right you're teaching yeah. and then books. there's the maths there's the maths there's the english yeah how there's much you know, everything, everything. everything. <laughs> <laughs> well they go out shopping and do the budgeting for the yeah. shopping as well yeah, yeah i yeah. love yeah. that like the actual and I know that when um, my kids were home during the lockdowns, 
um, there were so many projects that we did in the garden and outside and, and having a break to go walk on the beach. And yeah. then we came, yeah. took photos, came back and did all the writing for what we saw at the beach and found some crabs and stuff. So it was just, just um, I think we, we're so used to being busy, being busy. Yeah. That yeah. If, we, if we just stop and relax and center ourselves and go, actually, what is learning? What is learning? Yeah. No, it's, exactly. it's not mimicking and parroting back information. That's not learning. That's not even yeah. thinking. It's not remembering stuff and just having to regurgitate whatever you've been taught. It's, re yeah, to really learn how to critically think, isn't it? And be creative. Yeah, and, and look, I, I am getting goosebumps now. It's really, very exciting. But I have this philosophy around learning now it has it's probably always been like that but for in, in this and what we're in the new energy in the earth the earth's new energy right now and the frequency we're in right now it's all about our young people need to learn how to learn unlearn and relearn because yeah. if you think about how many jobs we've had over our lifetime we cannot expect that the future to be the same for our young people um, they have to be innovative, creative. They have to be able to be resilient and how yeah. they have to be able to relearn skills and unlearn old habits that don't serve them. And, and I think that's the same for us, Ruth. Yeah. We're, still learning, we're learning, you know, unlearn and relearn. We should be doing that, you know, and I think the more we can all do that, my goodness, imagine the impact that's going to have in the world if we can do that. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, so, that's how I've written in my um, my personal development. Sorry, JJ. That's yeah. how I've designed it to teach them, you know, what's something that you can unlearn right now? What's something yeah. that you need to go back and learn again? Yeah. And then what are you going to learn today about yourself? So that, that like, to create that metacognition when, when, when they're younger. So, because I don't want my kids to have all the troubles I had, <laughs> you know, growing up and making them... Yeah countless really big bad decisions yeah so, yeah um sorry i cut you off then <laughs> that's, that's awesome so how do people get in contact with you that want to work with you ruth well the best the best way great um i is by email or by phone just like make a phone i can just chat to you on the phone because yeah. i've got um email my email is i could put it in the give you it in writing as well jj yeah. but it's ruth yeah. R U T H at R J H Education Solutions with an S plural dot com. That's my email. Um, so if whether you're homeschooling or not, if you're looking for someone to help with English or maths tutoring or homeschooling, or just you know know someone who's got learning difficulties or anxiety. Uh, I see clients all the time, one-on-one -on -one in, in group situations for anxiety. Yeah. And and also you can get my book from my website as well if you were interested. I was going to ask you about that. So you've got your book. Yeah. You got book here, yeah. So just from, where's your website? What's so your my, website? My website is the same as my business name. So it's rjheducationsolutions.com. Beautiful. And I'll pop that in. The um, down below when I've got the YouTube, uh, I'll click this in into YouTube and so it'll be on there, guys. So if anyone wants um, to get in contact with Ruth. So thank you so much, Ruth. I could speak to you for hours. <laughs> but it's JJ's rapid question time. Ooh, I know you've got some questions for me. I do, I do. Um, those of you that haven't listened to uh, a podcast before, we have rapid question time and I fire some fun questions to my guests and they fire some back which can be a little bit concerning sometimes well, i'm nervous already <laughs> well, let's go all right are you ready i'm ready as i'm ever gonna be okay what's your favorite book to read oh think and grow rich i know it's a cliche but i yeah. just read that book again and again and again and see something it. different in it what hidden talent have you got well, um, my very first personal development conference I went to in Sydney, I karate chopped wood, a piece of pine in half. 
Beautiful. Um, was there was no karate training at all, just was um, being in the right state of mind. Beautiful. And I have done it again since. So um, that's my special so challenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What peeves you off? Sorry, what was that? What peeves you off? Oh, so much. <laughs> um, one thing is um, animal abuse. Great. Same. Who would play you in a movie? Ooh. I would have to say one of my avatars is, she's not, not an actress, but Lara Croft. Yes. Oh, I love yes. her. So um, I have an ambition secretly to turn my body into Lara Croft's body. <laughs> <laughs> so it'd have to be um, Angelina Jolie, wouldn't it? But in that, you know, Tomb Raider, Lara Croft. Uh, if you were asked to cook a dish, what would you cook? Oh, I'll just cook a really nice Sunday roast, you know, like roast yeah. lamb and veggies. and Yum, that's and always a winner. Yeah. Um, a mentor of yours? Uh, I've got so many mentors. Um, my one of my really, oh, who would I pick? I've got so many. I invest so much in my <laughs> mentorship. Um, would have to be Devana Alejandra in Western Australia because she taught me how to tap into my spiritual side to believe in who I am and just being authentic. So it would have to be her. And yeah. she's been, she's been the inspiration I got from working with her created the um, homeschool. So love it. Love it. <laughs> Strangest thing you've ever eaten? Snails. Right. <laughs> Favourite place to travel? <sighs> Favourite place to travel. There's a... Um, there's an island in New Zealand that was my favourite place to travel uh, and it was down um, by the Milford, Melbourne, Melbourne Sound. Yeah. It was yeah. just amazing. And uh, that would be my favourite place. I'd love to go to New Zealand again. Craziest thing you've ever done? Um, I've done so many things. Okay, I have to say um, I sold my house. I bought a, a four-wheel drive and a caravan and I took my kids and my dog around Australia in a caravan, not knowing how to reverse park. <laughs> Love caravan. And no. if one, one quick sentence, your legacy that you want to leave. Every single person can discover their inner strength and be the dream. Beautiful. Love it. Love it. All right. Your 10 are done. My okay. Ten. I remain my. far away my 10. I'm rethinking my questions now. Absolutely. They're not as exciting. <laughs> um, your favourite memory of being a teenager? My favourite memory of being a teenager would be when I, well, I used to be a professional dancer. So I used to dance at um, weddings and stuff. So I absolutely love that. Wow. Mm. That's exciting. <laughs> Question two. If you're an animal, it could be any animal, what would you be? Uh, I'd have to say, well, there'd be three. <laughs> <laughs> I love dogs. I'm passionate about dogs. I absolutely adore them. Uh, or I also love elephants and I also love dolphins. I just adore them. Oh, lovely. So I have to be three. You couldn't pick. You'd have to be a, a, a morphed dog, dolphin and elephant together, yeah. maybe. Or one <laughs> one each week or something yeah um if you come across Aladdin's lamp and you get free wishes what would your free wishes be oh that's a good one can I say uh as many wishes as I want <laughs> uh, gee those three wishes would be to oh that's that's a challenging one uh I'd say peace in the world but to to rid the world of any evil Mm. uh to be oh, I don't know what else I would say um but that's a definite one um and just to bring a better world and to be the best version of myself that I can serve the world that would be my three oh, lovely if you go on an escape on a holiday what would it be beach or bush beach, beach. <laughs> I love that <laughs> 
Question five, where did you go to primary school? In my, my first primary school was in um, oh, I think Collingwood, actually. And then I went to Clifton Hill. I lived in Melbourne. I live in Geelong now, for those that don't know. <laughs> okay, this, now this is a, a question because I know how much public speaking you've done. Yeah. What is the strangest or most unique place where you did public speaking? I did it in a place in New Zealand, actually. It wasn't really a strange place, but everything went wrong at the start. We couldn't get in. I had the guest coming. The person that was supposed to let us in didn't let us in. Um, and then my guest ended up setting up the event space for me. Uh, and we had the best time ever. <laughs> It's hilarious. <laughs> awesome. Okay, this is a cooking question. Yes. What is the hardest recipe you've ever made and succeeded in? Oh, I don't know. Uh, what would be the hardest recipe? Because I've seen so many things. I, know. I don't know. I, I don't know what that would be. I suppose every new big recipe that I've done, um, you know, the first time when I was learning to cook, uh, you know, some people say I can't, you can't cook. Well, I think anyone can cook. It's just about um, a recipe, following the recipe and doing it over and over and over again. So, you know, the first time I cooked lasagna was a challenge. Now I cook it with my eyes closed. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, what is a funny mistake that you've made that led to a, weird, a new opportunity, a funny mistake? Funny mistake that I've made. I'm making mistakes all the time. Um, and because if I don't, I'm not learning. And, and I, that's a really big belief for me. Um, I've done funny things. I've, I've actually presented and fallen over. And then that's been a time where everyone's wanted to sign up on my course. <laughs> so maybe that's it. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Perfect. Um, question nine. What is your person? Now, this question was I had I was one question short. Yeah. And my son Riley gave me this question. Yeah. Uh, what is your personal kryptonite? Love. 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 Yep. <laughs> and question 10. If you could do have a, a sit-down dinner in private with five people, dead or alive, who would you invite? I would definitely invite my dad, who's no longer with us. I would have my dad. I'd invite my son, who's who's no longer with us, um, Raymond. So the two Raymonds. My dad's name was Raymond and my son's name was Raymond. So I'd have the two Raymonds. Then I would have God. And then I would have oh, the last two. I don't know what the last two, I might have someone fun like, I don't know, Elvis Presley <laughs> for the music and for the comedy, maybe someone, oh, who can I have for the comedy? Oh, I don't know. I oh, know I have Tony Robbins. Yeah, I'd love to chat with Tony. <laughs> Great. Yay, the 10 were done. Yay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ruth. I uh, really appreciate it. You've been such a joy and I could absolutely talk to you for another hour. Um, so thank you so much. I'll put your details down below. I know that homeschooling is a hot topic at the moment. So I'm sure you're going to get a lot of people contacting you and asking you questions and getting your amazing book that you wrote, because I think that's fantastic to have a tool at home that you can flip, you know, flick through and get some great ideas. Um, because I know our intentions as parents are always to do the best thing for our kids. So, and I think now is the time to look outside the box and say we can do things differently. So thank you so much. Uh, and yes, I'll have to have you back on again later on after you've set up all these homeschooling stuff. And um, yeah, I'd love to have you back on. Thank you so much. Thank you, JJ. Thanks, Ruth.